This is Canada News Libre. Do not let the hero in your soul perish in lonely frustration for the life you deserve but have never been able to reach. Check your road and the nature of your battle. The world you've desired can be won. It exists. It is real. It is possible. It's yours. Fight for the value of your person. Fight for the virtue of your pride. Fight for the essence of that which is man, for his sovereign, rational mind. Fight with the radiant certainty and the absolute rectitude of knowing that yours is the morality of life, and that yours is the battle for any achievement, any value, any grandeur, any goodness, any joy that has ever existed on this earth. Human rights is, um, geez, that's a good question. Human rights, well, that's a tough one. Wow. Um, well, that's a little good. I don't even know how to give that a definition. I would probably have to do a little bit of homework or something. Yeah, any right that I think any, just as a normal, you know, uh, human, any. The rights that humans have. Oh, that's a very large debate. Me es que cada que tú manches. Te dura puedes preguntar a 20 personas y te van a dar 20 diferentes opiniones. No sabré, una pregunta complicadísima. Sorry. We just take it for granted that they're there, but we don't even consider what they are. The term individual rights is a redundancy. There is no other kind of rights, and no one else to possess them. People don't know their rights and their freedoms anymore. We're not taught these things. They're almost like foreign concepts. But human rights are the only ones that apply to absolutely everyone, everywhere. That means kids, old people, poor people, basketball players, garbage men, rappers, teachers, Africans, Indians, Albanians, Christians, Muslims, Kabbalists, atheists, your mom, your dad, your next door neighbor, and you all have the exact same human rights. In other words, they're universal. But the question remains, what are they? There is only one fundamental right. All the others are its consequences or corollaries. A man's right to his own life. Life is a process of self-sustaining and self-generated action. The right to life means the right to engage in self-sustaining and self-generated action, which means the freedom to take all the actions required by the nature of a rational being for the support, the furtherance, the fulfillment, and the enjoyment of his own life. Such is the meaning of the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. John Locke was an English philosopher and physician, who is regarded as one of the most influential of Enlightenment thinkers, and known as the father of classical liberalism. A professor at Harvard, Michael Sandel, has said, John Locke believes that there are certain fundamental individual rights that are so important that no government, even a democratically elected government, can override them. Not only that, he believes that those fundamental rights include a natural right to life, liberty, and property. And furthermore, he argues that the right to property is not just the creation of government or of law. The right to property is a natural right in the sense that it is pre-political. It is a right that attaches to individuals as human beings, even before government comes on the scene, even before parliaments and legislatures enact laws to define rights and to enforce them. Locke says, in order to think about what it means to have a natural right, we have to imagine the way things are before government. The right to life is the source of all rights, and the right to property is their only implementation. Without property rights, no other rights are possible. Since man has to sustain his life by his own effort, the man who has no right to the product of his effort has no means to sustain his life. The man who produces while others dispose of his product is a slave. At first, there were no human rights. If you were in with the right crowd, you were safe. If you weren't, well, you weren't. 
But then a guy named Cyrus the Great decided to change all that. After conquering Babylon, he did something completely revolutionary. He announced that all slaves were free to go. He also said people had the freedom to choose their religion, no matter what crowd they were a part of. They documented his words on a clay tablet known as the Cyrus Cylinder. And just like that, human rights were born. The idea spread quickly to Greece, to India, and eventually to Rome. They noticed that people naturally followed certain laws, even if they weren't told to. They called this natural law, but it kept getting trampled on by those in power. Not until a thousand years later in England did they finally get a king to agree that no one can overrule the rights of the people, not even a king. People's rights were finally recognized, and they were now safe from those in power. Kind of. It still took a bunch of British rebels declaring their independence before the king got the point that all men are created equal. Which isn't to say he liked the idea, but he couldn't stop them, and America was born. The French immediately followed with their own revolution for their own rights. Their list was even longer, and they insisted that these rights weren't just made up. They were natural. The Roman concept of natural law had become natural rights. Unfortunately, not everyone was so thrilled. The man who refuses to submit and to serve, Howard Rock, is the man who must be destroyed. Bear in mind that the right to property is a right to action like all the others. It is not the right to an object, but to the action and the consequences of producing or earning that object. It is not a guarantee that a man will earn any property, but only a guarantee that he will own it if he earns it. It is the right to gain, to keep, to use, and to dispose of material values. To violate man's rights means to compel him to act against his own judgment or to expropriate his values. Basically, there is only one way to do it, by the use of physical force. There are two potential violators of man's rights, the criminals and the government. The great achievement of the United States was to draw a distinction between these two by forbidding to the second the legalized version of the activities of the first. The Declaration of Independence laid down the principle that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. This provided the only valid justification of a government and defined its only proper purpose, to protect man's rights by protecting him from physical violence. Thus, the government's function was changed from the role of ruler to the role of servant. The government was set to protect man from criminals, and the Constitution was written to protect man from the government. The Bill of Rights was not directed against private citizens, but against the government as an explicit declaration that individual rights supersede any public or social power. The Bill of Rights guaranteed that the government could not on its own assault your natural rights. Among them, that quintessentially American right, the right to be left alone. Notice also how the Bill of Rights takes a natural law approach to our liberties. It doesn't grant us freedoms, it protects freedoms that are given to us at birth. Listen to the language of the Bill of Rights. Congress shall make no law prohibiting. Congress, political law, may not abridge or infringe. Wording like this simply means that politicians may not prohibit or abridge or infringe upon pre-existing rights. The Bill of Rights does not grant these rights because no human instrument, not even the Constitution, has the power to grant those rights. They pre-exist. They are inherent. They are, in fact, unalienable. You see, if people do not have any unalienable rights, then they have no protection at all from any political law. The king or the sultan or the czar or even the majority in a freely elected Congress determine what laws people will have to live under, which they may employ by force and without any consent. It's all arbitrary. And since it doesn't come from a higher authority, it can be modified at any time. And frankly, if people really can't be trusted with liberty and self-government, then probably the more laws, the better. But if we are, in fact, born free, then the question isn't how many laws we need, but how few. What is the fewest number of laws that free people need? Well, it turns out they just need two. 
First, do all that you agreed to do. Second, do not encroach upon other persons or their property. Now, do all that you agreed to do is the basis for contract law. Do not encroach on other persons or their property is the basis for all criminal law or tort law, in other words, private lawsuits. Thomas Jefferson said that rightful liberty is unobstructed action according to our will with limits drawn around us by the equal rights of others. Unobstructed action according to our will means you can do whatever you darn well want to. You are a free person, but your freedom of action ends when other people or their property are harmed by your actions. It's just that simple. That's all you really need. Locke says the state of nature is the state of liberty. Human beings are free and equal beings. There is no natural hierarchy. It's not the case that some people are born to be kings and others were born to be serfs. We're free and equal in the state of nature. Unalienable rights, rights that are so essentially mine that even I can't trade them away or give them up. So these are the rights we have in the state of nature before there is any government. In the case of life and liberty, I can't take my own life, I can't sell myself into slavery, any more than I can take somebody else's life or take someone else as a slave by force. Alongside the whole story about consent and majority rule, there are these natural rights, the law of nature, these inalienable rights. They don't disappear when people join together to create a civil society. So even once the majority is in charge, the majority can't violate your unalienable rights can't violate your fundamental right to life, liberty, and property. For John Locke, the law of nature persists once government arrived. Government is limited by the end for which it was created, namely, the preservation of property. No parliament, no legislature, however democratic its credentials, can legitimately violate our natural rights. The government can't take your property without your consent. Locke is clear about that. Rights are a moral concept the concept that provides a logical transition from the principles guiding an individual's actions to the principles guiding his relationship with others. Individual rights are the means of subordinating society to moral law. Every political system is based on some code of ethics. The dominant ethics of mankind's history were variants of the altruist collectivist doctrine which subordinated the individual to some higher authority, either mystical or social. Consequently, most political systems were variants of the same status tyranny, differing only in degree, not in basic principle, limited only by the accidents of tradition, of chaos, of bloody strife and periodic collapse. Under all such systems, morality was a code applicable to the individual but not to society. Society was placed outside the moral law as its embodiment or source or exclusive interpreter. Since there is no such entity as society, since society is only a number of individual men, this meant in practice that the rulers of society were exempt from moral law subject only to traditional rituals they held total power and exacted blind obedience on the implicit principle of the good is that which is good for society or for the tribe the race the nation and the rulers edicts are its voice on earth this was true of all statist systems under all variants of the altruist collectivist ethics mystical or social as witness the theocracy of Egypt, with the pharaoh as an embodied god. The unlimited majority rule or democracy of Athens. The welfare state run by the emperors of Rome. The inquisition of the late Middle Ages. The gas chambers of Nazi Germany. The slaughterhouse of the Soviet Union. All these political systems were expressions of the altruist collectivist ethics and their common characteristic is the fact that society stood above the moral law as an omnipotent, sovereign whim-worshipper. The most profoundly revolutionary achievement of the United States of America was the subordination of society to moral law. The principle of man's individual rights represented the extension of morality into the social system as a limitation on the power of the state, as man's protection against the brute force of the collective as the subordination of might to right. 
All previous systems had regarded man as a sacrificial means to the ends of others, and society as an end in itself. The United States regarded man as an end in himself, and society as a means to the peaceful, orderly, voluntary coexistence of individuals. All previous systems had held that man's life belongs to society, that society can dispose of him in any way it pleases, and that any freedom he enjoys is his only by favor, by the permission of society, which may be revoked at any time. The United States held that man's life is his by right, which means by moral principle and by his nature, that a right is the property of an individual, that society as such has no rights, and that the only moral purpose of a government is the protection of individual rights. Now, the United States of America is the first, and as far as I know, the only country in the history of the world to be founded on natural law. The Declaration of Independence was an appeal to the world, an appeal to overthrow the corrupt political law of King George and invoke a higher law, natural law, as justification for this action. Probably the most definitive sentence ever written on natural law, certainly the most famous sentence, is this one. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What a sentence. First, we hold these truths, not these opinions, not these agreements, not this consensus, not this vote, these truths, fundamental realities that any person in any culture can reason out for himself. To be self-evident, that means we didn't write them, we didn't create them, we don't allow them or grant them permission. They are self-evident because they were here before we were. That all men are created equal, obviously not equally rich or equally smart or equally tall or equally fast, but equal under the law, which applies to the rich and powerful as well as to the poor and friendless that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. Now, for people who believe in God, this is self-explanatory, but even people who do not believe in God need to believe in this, that each human has, as his birthright, certain rights that cannot be taken away, and that these rights are bestowed upon us not by people, not by governments, but by a force far greater than people or government. You could call it history, call it human evolution, call it justice, but whatever it is, it is beyond the reach of mortal men and women. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's easy to forget how radically new an idea America is. The Founding Fathers invented a new form of government. All previous forms of government had concentrated power into the hands of the state at the expense of the individual. Theocracy placed power into the hands of priests and popes, who, as spokesmen for the supernatural, were to be obeyed without question. Monarchy placed power into the hands of a king or a queen, whose subjects lived and died by the ruler's edicts. Democracy placed power into the hands of the majority, who could do whatever they wished to the minority. In all these systems, recalcitrant individuals were dealt with in the same way. They were greeted with the instruments of physical compulsion, with imprisonment, torture, death. To all such outrages, the Founding Fathers said no more. They devised a political system that placed power into the hands of the individual at the expense of the state. The government does not stand above the individual as his master. The government stands below the individual as its servant. The reasoning mind cannot work under any form of compulsion. It cannot be subordinated to the needs, opinions, or wishes of others. It is not an object of sacrifice. The Creator stands on his own judgment. The parasite follows the opinions of others. The creator thinks. The parasite copies. The creator produces. The parasite loots. 
The creator's concern is the conquest of nature. The parasite's concern is the conquest of man. The creator requires independence. He, he neither serves nor rules. He deals with men by free exchange and voluntary choice. The parasite seeks power. He wants to bind all men together in common action and common slavery. He, he claims that man is only a tool for the use of others. That he must think as they think, act as they act, and live in selfless, joyless servitude to any need but his own. Look at history. Everything we have, every great achievement has come from the independent work of some independent mind. Every horror and destruction came from attempts to force men into a herd of brainless, soulless robots without personal rights, without personal ambition, without will, hope, or dignity. It is an ancient conflict. It has another name, the individual against the collective. Our country, the noblest country in the history of men, was based on the principle of individualism, the principle of man's inalienable rights. It was a country where a man was free to seek his own happiness, to gain and produce, not to give up and renounce, to prosper, not to starve, to achieve, not to plunder, to hold as his highest possession a sense of his personal value, and as his highest virtue, his self-respect. Look at the results. That is what the collectivists are now asking you to destroy as much of the earth has been destroyed. I am an architect. I know what is to come by the principle on which it is built. We are approaching a world in which I cannot permit myself to live. My ideas are my property. They were taken from me by force, by breach of contract. No appeal was left to me. It was believed that my work belonged to others to do with as they pleased. They had a claim upon me without my consent that it was my duty to serve them without choice or reward. I came here to say that I do not recognize anyone's right to one minute of my life, nor to any part of my energy, nor to any achievement of mine, no matter who makes the claim. It had to be said, the world is perishing from an orgy of self-sacrificing. I came here to be heard in the name of every man of independence still left in the world. I wanted to state my terms. I do not care to work or live on any others. My terms are a man's right to exist for his own sake. What does it mean to own something? It means that you and you alone have the right to decide what is done with that thing. What is yours you can use, you can trade, you can give away, you can destroy. So what does it mean to say you own yourself? It means that you and you alone have the right to decide what is done with your body and your mind, with your time and your energy. If someone else had the right to decide what is done with your body and your mind, your time and your energy, then he would be your owner and you would be his slave. So, are you anyone's slave? Do you pay taxes? Do you feel obligated to obey whatever the politicians decide to call law? Do you imagine that someone else has the right to control you, to rule you? Do you vote? In every political election, you are asked to decide who you want owning you, but owning yourself is never one of the options offered. The only choice you are given is the choice of which politicians will coerce and control you by way of so-called regulation and legislation and confiscate what you produce by way of taxation. Whoever wins, you will be extorted and dominated. When you vote, whether you win or not, you are accepting that someone else has the right to rule you. You are conceding the state's authority over you. You are agreeing that you are going to be someone's slave, with the only question being which political master will own you. If you believe that you have an obligation to pay taxes, if you concede that it is up to someone else to decide how much of your earnings they will let you keep, then you are their slave. If you own yourself, you don't need the permission of anyone, any individual, any group, any collective, any country, any legislature, to run your own life, make your own choices, and keep the fruits of your own labor.
So your rights are property. That's very, very important to understand. Very important to understand. Rights that are your property for your exclusive use. Now those rights are yours for your exclusive use. Okay? Unalienable. Unalienable means that they cannot be removed from you without altering what you are. Okay? They're unalienable. Again, property. People have a misconception of what property is. These, again, don't, don't take my word for it. I mean, that's, that's a simple definition. Anybody can look that up in Black's Law Dictionary. It's not in a statute. That's what the actual word means. Not my opinion. Property. That which is peculiar or proper to any person. That which belongs exclusively to one. In the strict legal sense, an aggregate of rights which are guaranteed and protected by the government. Yeah, we can get into that. Um, the term is said to extend to every species of valuable right and interest. We don't really need to get much beyond that to start painting in more holes in the picture here. So, if it is and extends to every species of valuable right and interest, now we know that I'm equal to everybody else, I have equal rights, um, and those rights are my property. Your rights are yours, no different than an arm or a leg. They're a part of you, they're indistinguishable, whether they're physical or not. It's still something you possess, it is your property. And no one has any right to it but you. And that harms you if that has been denied to you. Because, again, who has the authority to deny that to you? But, well, we're only talking about rights right now, so that'd be your creator, the God of nature. He's the only one that can do that. The act of removing it harms you, causes an injury, which is a loss. That loss is a cause of action. And that's very important because when people want to start going back for remedy and recourse here right away, and we're going to get more involved into this too. But because all of these things cannot be denied to you without that party causing you harm and you having a cause of action, they had to figure out a way to get around all of that and not just come right out and enslave you the way they used to, you know, 100 years ago. So there's a new form of slavery. It's word slavery, mind slavery. If they can convince you of certain truths, then they haven't harmed you because you did it to yourself. You went and you accepted their offer to be recognized as a legal person or uh, a human being in their system. Now a lot of people have come to me in the, in the past, and I've never ever been big on the uh, UN Declaration of Human Rights. I'll quote it at times, I'll say, well, you know, even they agree that as a human being I have that right. Now the problem is I don't even like the word human being at all. And it wasn't until I actually showed somebody the reason why the other day that they couldn't believe it. And, uh, well, let me ask everybody, do, do you all have human rights? Oh, natural rights. That's a better word. Okay, everybody wants human rights because, man, they've made international charters on this. You got the right to be a human being. That's great. Um, and my, my answer to that is, when was the last time the United Nations did something that was genuinely good for any of the people on this planet? Never. Never. But they just, in all their benevolence, decided they were going to grant you these rights as a human being. A human being is an artificial person. Persons are divided by the law into either natural persons or artificial. Natural persons are such as the God of nature formed us. That's very succinct. I like that. There's no further explanation. That's it. Natural persons are such as the God of nature formed us with all my unalienable rights intact. Artificial are such as created and devised by human laws for the purposes of society and government, which are called corporations or bodies politic. Okay? So, that's what the legal person is. The legal person, or human being, which are one and the same, they are both a body politic. The UN is a body politic. What else 
couldn't recognize but other body politics. Another political body. They're a political organization. What else could they recognize? You think they're recognizing the rights of man as created by the God of nature? Nope. All part of the illusion. You can't go after remedy if you don't even know what your rights are because then you cannot express a proper cause of action. That's why you're kept ignorant. a serious situation going on certainly is not a stretch of the imagination to think that somebody like Dean Clifford would be targeted um, do, do, do you think it's likely that they're trying to um, set an example or, or silence somebody such as, as Dean uh, it seems strange to me that he would go to jail for so long that it would unfold in this manner over a simple driving uh, even if it was an infraction he is uh, notoriously known as a, a political uh, activist and an advocate of change in government. So it's not a far stretch to believe that this judicial system is being abused by a few people in order to punish him for his views and is, is being vocal about it. So that, that wouldn't surprise me. I don't know. I think they're getting scared. I think they're starting to realize that people are sick and tired of their, their abuse of power and authority and people are saying no to it. I mean, they're... They're stupid to try this stuff in Canada. I mean, I've been all over Canada. I know your your average Canadian. We tend to be very laissez-faire and uh, very easygoing, but once you cross a line, that that's it. And I think a lot of people are realizing the people in the government, the bankers, the politicians, and the cops, they all think they're above the law and that we're their, their chattel property. They've used deception to get us into a position of ward of the state underneath them, when we should be masters over our servants, and uh, the chickens are coming home to roost, eh? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're, you're not going to be able to silence it, because people, once they see it, they see it, and once you've seen it, you can't unsee it, where's and the, the... further uh, supports our belief in it. So, I mean, they've got to come up with something besides the old ways of, uh, of dealing with this dissent. I mean, it's... The boots and the claim of the crown, and oh, I have divine authority, and I have the guns, it, it's not working anymore. Potentially, a government is the most dangerous threat to man's rights. It holds a legal monopoly on the use of physical force against legally disarmed victims. When unlimited and unrestricted by individual rights, a government is men's deadliest enemy. Political law is simply the law as written by individuals. It varies with the whims of the individuals that wrote it. It is arbitrary. It is constantly changing, and it is therefore unpredictable. People with political power write political law. Power by nature expands. That's why we have a constitution, to restrain governmental power. Who would want to live in a society where the government was unrestrained? Have we fought wars against totalitarian governments only to find that we have elected one here at home? Somewhere a perversion has taken place. Our natural unalienable rights are now considered to be a dispensation of government. And freedom has never been so fragile, so close to slipping from our grasp as it is at this moment. What if voting didn't mean anything anymore because both political parties stand for big government? What if the government could write any law, regulate any behavior, and tax any event? The Constitution be damned. What if the government was the reason we don't have a constitution anymore? What if you could love your country, but hate what the government has done to it? What if sometimes to love your country, you had to alter or abolish the government? What if Jefferson was right? What if that government is best which governs least? What if I'm right? What if the government is wrong? What if it is dangerous to be right when the government is wrong? What if it is better to perish fighting for freedom? than to live as a slave. What if freedom's greatest hour of danger is now? Have we become a nation of sheep? Sadly, the answers to these questions are obvious.
Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Thompson, your president, will not be speaking with you tonight. His time is up. I have taken it over. You are to hear a report on the world crisis. That is what you are going to hear. For 12 years, you have been asking who is John Galt. This is John Galt speaking. I am the man who loves his life. I am the man who does not sacrifice his love or his values. Twelve years ago when I worked in your world, I was an inventor. Like the man who discovered the use of steam or the man who discovered the use of oil, I discovered a source of energy which had been available since the birth of the globe but which men had not known how to use except as an object of worship of terror and of legends without a thundering god. I invented a motor that draws its energy from the atmosphere, a perpetually running motor. It would have raised the efficiency of every human installation using power. It would have made a fortune for me and for those who had hired me. Then one night at a factory meeting I heard myself sentenced to death by reason of my achievement. I heard three parasites assert that my brain and my life were their property. That my right to exist was conditional and depended upon the satisfaction of their desires. The purpose of my ability, they said, was to serve the needs of those who were less able. Just as the parasites were counting on my self-immolation to carry out the means of their plan so throughout the world and throughout men's history in every version and form I saw I could put an end to your outrages by pronouncing a single word in my mind I pronounced it the word was no it was the concept of individual rights that had given birth to a free society it was with the destruction of individual rights that the destruction of freedom had to begin. A collectivist tyranny dare not enslave a country by an outright confiscation of its values, material or moral. It has to be done by a process of internal corruption. Just as in the material realm the plundering of a country's wealth is accomplished by inflating the currency, so today one may witness the process of inflation being applied to the realm of rights. The process entails such a growth of newly promulgated rights that people do not notice the fact that the meaning of the concept is being reversed. Just as bad money drives out good money, so these printing press rights negate authentic rights. As long as the politicians see you voting, petitioning, protesting, and campaigning, begging for tax cuts, whining for different legislation, as long as they see you timidly obeying whatever commands they issue, while begging them to change their so-called laws, then they know that they own you in mind and body. The slave master doesn't mind his slaves pitifully begging for mercy, as long as they keep obeying and keep producing wealth for the master to steal. Those in power aren't worried about elections or petitions. What they do fear is that one day their victims will realize the truth, will stop believing in the divine right of politicians, will stop believing that anyone has the right to rule them, will stop imagining authority where there is none, will realize that they own themselves. If you own your time and effort and the fruits of your labor, then stop asking nicely to be allowed to keep it. If you own yourself, then stop asking nicely for legislative permission to run your own life. If you actually believe in unalienable rights, in individual liberty, in freedom, then stop asking nicely for the sociopathic parasites to let you be free. For humanity to be free, people need to stop thinking, talking, and acting like slaves. If you truly understand that you own yourself, then start acting like it. Whoever you are, you who are alone with my words in this moment, with nothing but your honesty to help you understand. The choice is still open to be a human being, but the price is to start from scratch, to stand naked in the face of reality and reversing a costly historical error to declare, I am, therefore I'll think.
When you cried in despair for the unattainable spirit which you felt had deserted your world, you gave it my name. But what you were calling was your own betrayed self-esteem. You who've lost the concept of a right. Rights are conditions of existence required by man's nature for his proper survival. If man is to live on earth, it is right for him to use his mind. It is right to act on his own free judgment. It is right to work for his values and to keep the product of his work. If life on earth is his purpose, he has a right to live as a rational being. Nature forbids him the irrational. Any group, any gang, any nation that attempts to negate man's rights is wrong. Only a slave can work with no right to the product of his effort. The only proper purpose of a government is to protect man's rights, which means to protect him from physical violence. A proper government is only a policeman, acting as an agent of man's self-defense, and as such may resort to force only against those who start the use of force. Now that you know the truth about your world, stop supporting your own destroyers. The evil of the world is made possible by nothing but the sanction you give it. Withdraw your sanction. Withdraw your support. Do not try to live on your enemy's terms or to win at a game where they're setting the rules. Do not seek the favor of those who enslaved you. The more you pay them, the more they will demand. The greater the values you seek or achieve, the more vulnerably helpless you become. Do not attempt to rise on the looter's terms or to climb a ladder while they're holding the ropes. Do not allow their hands to touch the only power that keeps them in power, your living ambition. Do not try to produce a fortune with a looter riding on your back. Stay on the lowest rung of their ladder. Earn no more than your barest survive. Do not make an extra penny to support the looter's state. Since you're captive, act as a captive. Do not help them pretend that you're free. Be the silent, incorruptible enemy they dread. When they force you, obey. But do not volunteer. Never volunteer a step in their direction, or a wish, or a plea, or a purpose. Your sanction is their only life belt. If you find a chance to vanish into some wilderness out of their reach, do so. But not to exist as a bandit or to create a gang competing with their racket. Build a productive life of your own with those who accept your moral code and are willing to struggle for a human existence. You have no chance to win on the morality of death or by the code of faith and force. Raise a standard to which the honest will repair, the standard of life and reason. Act as a rational being, and aim at becoming a rallying point for all those who are starved for a voice of integrity. Act on your rational values, whether alone in the midst of your enemies or with a few of your chosen friends, or as the founder of a modest community on the frontier of mankind's rebirth. Such is the future you are capable of winning. Do you wish to continue the battle of your present, or do you wish to fight for my world? Do you wish to continue a struggle that consists of clinging to precarious ledges in a sliding descent to the abyss? Such is the choice before you. Let your mind and your love of existence decide. The last of my words will be addressed to those heroes who might still be hidden in the world. Those who are held prisoner not by their evasions, but by their virtues and their desperate courage. My brothers in spirit, Check on your virtues and on the nature of the enemies you're serving. Your destroyers hold you by means of your endurance, your generosity, your innocence, your love. Do not let the hero in your soul perish in lonely frustration for the life you deserve, but have never been able to reach. Check your road and the nature of your battle. The world you desired can be won. It exists. It is real. It is possible. It's yours. Fight for the value of your person. Fight for the virtue of your pride. Fight for the essence of that which is man, for his sovereign, rational mind. Fight with the radiant certainty and the absolute rectitude of knowing that yours is the morality of life, and that yours is the battle for any achievement, any value, any grandeur, any goodness, any joy that has ever existed on this earth. You will win when you are ready to pronounce the oath I have taken at the start of my battle. And for those who wish to know the day of my return, I shall now repeat it to the hearing of the world. I swear by my life and my love of it, that I will never live for the sake of another man, nor ask another man to live for mine.
when it comes to control, that is your topic. Um, why is control needed in the eyes of those uh, having already so much money that they can buy everything they want? Well, they can't. They can't. And uh, that's what makes us human beings human beings and, and them uh, inhuman beings, as I would, I would call it. They can't control life. They can't. Uh, there's something called the human spirit that uh, no amount of money can buy. The only thing they can do is create institutions that create fear among us. And we have one thing is, as human beings, as living human beings, authentic, real human beings, and that is the power to love. And that terrifies them. It mm. scares the devil out of them. Yes. Because they've never had the emotion of love in their own childhood, in their own lives. And that's, uh, that's something that terrifies them.